In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts, data sets, and studies to help us answer the question. Will investors have to deal with an interest rate induced debt crisis? We'll be moving quickly, so feel free to use the pause button on your video player. The entire video is being recorded late in the session on Friday, August 25th, post Jackson Hole. S&P's up approximately 35 points for the week. And this chart that we covered last week on your screen when price was at 44.04, late in today's session, basically the same spot, 44.06. Moral of the story, everything that we talked about last week from a support perspective, a possible support perspective still applies. Chairman Powell delivered his Jackson Hole speech this morning around 10 a.m. Eastern time. You may remember last year, after the Jackson Hole speech, so approximately one year ago, stocks dropped rapidly and painfully from late August into the October low. Thus, prudent to ask an answer. Are we in here we go again territory? And of course, we want to answer that question in an objective manner. Last year, Jackson Hole took place on Friday, August 26th. The market was weak last year heading into Jackson Hole, and it was weak after Powell's speech, finishing the five-day period down a little over 4%. And from a trend perspective, the slowest moving average, the 50-week in green, was on top. The fastest moving average, the 20-week in blue, was on the bottom. This is a full-bore bullish look over here in 2021. This is the look at the end of the week August 26, 2022. How does the exact same chart look today? Better, worse, or about the same? Much better. Left side of your screen, blue, the fastest moving averages on the bottom and the slope is down. Right side of your screen, blue, the fastest moving averages on the top and the slope is up. Anything can happen, but the probabilities from an intermediate and longer term perspective are much more favorable in August of 2023 relative to 2022. So let's start with the base case this week and see if we can poke some holes in it. Heading into Jackson Hole Week, despite the recent weakness, the technicals and the fundamentals that we have in hand support a demographically driven secular bull market that could last until 2034 or 2035-ish. It's always prudent to stress test the base case by asking, what could cause us to veer significantly off course? We could rephrase that in August of 2023 to what could cause much worse than expected outcomes. If you know the macro backdrop, a major debt crisis is probably near the top of the list. Why is it prudent to stress test the debt crisis scenario? We had borderline irresponsibly low interest rates for a very long period of time, which gave market participants, including governments, an incentive to take on debt. In August of 2023, the system is loaded with debt. We know the Fed just raised interest rates at a rare and rapid rate. The regional banking sector earlier in the year told us A, B, and C paired together can cause some problems. Let's pose the stress test question in a different manner. Hypothetically, how could we see a major recession sometime in the next 18 months? One possible scenario is that inflation remains higher than the Fed anticipates and higher than the markets anticipate, and it does so for a long period of time, let's say the next three years, forcing the Fed to hike further and keep rates higher for longer, which impacts asset values and balance sheets. And when you have A here and B here, it's much more difficult to roll over debt and there are well-documented potential problems in the commercial real estate sector that are most likely going to have to be dealt with in the next one to three years. And under this hypothetical scenario, it's possible that bond default rates will increase significantly in the coming years, which in turn would cause even tighter credit standards. And eventually that impacts growth, employment, consumer spending, corporate spending, earnings, the economy, etc. And all of that typically would not be good for the financial markets. And that in turn has a tendency to have a negative wealth effect, suppressing spending even further. 
These are not particularly new topics, and we've covered them in the past. And common sense tells us if we're going to see something like this and or like this, then it's not likely that we're going to get a longer term outcome that looks like this or this. Under those hypothetical circumstances, the more likely outcome would look more like this or this or similar to this and this. And the key battleground tends to occur in the red box here and or the red box here. In this case, we're looking at the 40 month moving average in red and the 10 month moving average in blue here. Price action and human behavior inside this red box and inside this red box is significantly different relative to the green boxes on your screen. In short, price action and human behavior is quite different in periods of secular stagnation relative to price action and human behavior within the context of a secular bull market. And if you look at the two secular bull periods that we've been talking about now for several weeks or months, primarily being 1950 to the end of 1968 and from 1982 into the spring of 2000, in those periods, you really don't see anything that we could classify as a severe recession and or a debt crisis, at least of the prolonged and broadly impacting variety. Thus, if something like this is going to occur, it's not likely that we're going to see an outcome like this, 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 or this, when price inevitably revisits the 40 month moving average in red. We would more likely see human behavior more like this red box and this red box. Since the financial crisis tends to be fresh in everyone's mind relative to these other periods, let's examine this window here first. This is calendar year 2009 to the right down here. This is 2008 here. And we're going to focus on a daily chart in 2008 in this window here. This is what the chart of the S&P 500 looked like on September 12th, 2008. And this is what happened next. A market with a highly vulnerable profile lost an additional 45.95% between point A on September 12th, 2008 and point B on March 9th of 2009. And not surprisingly, when we see the market drop almost 50% in a matter of months, that's typically associated with a severe recession or crisis. We just looked at this window here. Now let's look at this window here in calendar year 2001 inside the red box where most of these battles are fought. This is a daily chart of the S&P 500 on June 13th, 2001. And what happened next was also extremely painful. The additional loss from point A on June 13th, 2001 to point B down here in October of 2002 was 37.44%. Now let's go back and look at the period of secular stagnation between 1969 and 1977, with the primary window being between the end of 1969 and this low here in 1974. And in this case, we'll start in this red box over here in calendar year 1969. The battle near the 40 month moving average was decisively won in this case by the bears. And thus, it's not particularly surprising if we walk forward from November 21st, 1969, with this look on the S&P 500's daily chart, it too was rapid and painful. The additional loss from point A to point B down here, 26.54%. It's another area where the battle was lost. In this window here, 1974. You may notice there's a similar look on these S&P 500 charts. You're typically consolidating near an area of potential support from the rear view mirror. But when we walked forward from March 27th, 1974, it was extremely rapid and extremely painful. The additional loss from point A to point B down here in the lower right hand corner, 35.52%. If we quickly review all four painful outcomes and then 
calculate the median outcome, we find the S&P 500 dropped 36.48% in 188 calendar days or approximately 6.3 months. Painful and rapid. In terms of better understanding and respecting the hypothetical downside risk in a scenario like this, if something similar happened on the S&P 500's chart dated August 24th of 2023, we would hypothetically see the S&P 500 land somewhere in the vicinity of 2800 at the end of February 2024. And when we're considering a drop of this magnitude here that occurs in a relatively short time frame, the concept here from last week still applies. One of the keys to avoiding a second leg drawdown like this is to size up the entire market and its trend. It applies to bullish scenarios and it applies to bearish scenarios. Thus, it's prudent for us to have tools in our toolkit that enable us to continually stress test the base case of a demographically induced secular bull market that could last until 2034 or 2035. And we already have a lot of man hours invested in that type of project. Well, step one is to compare the green boxes to the red boxes in order to increase the probability of making prudent and rational decisions in the next 10 to 12 years. And if we cover an example, it will help illustrate the concepts. Still a lot of work to be done here, but we want to get a feel of where we stand relative to significant downside risks. And thus, our prototype asks 505 binary questions. Yes or no? You literally type in a zero or a one. And we build and score these models manually because we want to get a feel for human behavior and price action as reflected in charts. So it's not a black box. 505 binary questions about the stock market's volatility and trend profiles on daily, weekly, and monthly timeframes. We always try to make things as simple as possible, and thus the scores range from 100%, that's what a strong secular trend looks like, to 0%. The market's profile really doesn't look anything like a secular trend, and it's a weak and vulnerable profile. And we learn something about the market with every score between 0 and 100, allowing us to objectively compare August 2023 to favorable and unfavorable environments for markets and the economy, which seems reasonable. If we think something like this could potentially happen in terms of assessing probabilities, it's probably prudent for us to understand if the base case is unraveling in a significant manner. So how can all of this potentially help us? Let's see what the score looked like on September 12th of 2008, with zero being the lowest and 100 being the highest. And keep in mind, this is the score before really bad things happened. Not really anywhere in the neighborhood of 100%. In fact, extremely weak at 10%. 90% of the boxes cannot be checked. How about the 2001 case? What was the score before really bad things happened? An unimpressive 20% of the boxes could be checked, meaning 80% could not be checked. What did the profile look like in 1969 before the market dropped an additional 26.54% a matter of months? Answer, approximately 25% of the boxes could be checked, meaning 75% of the bullish boxes and secular trend type boxes could not be checked. And in the 1974 case, before an additional decline of 35.52%, extremely weak profile at 14.46%. It's prudent in the markets to remember that anything can happen at any time, including a 36% drop, additional drop, between now and the end of February 2024. And if something like this were going to happen, we would expect the present-day profile to be similar to these vulnerable profiles. The median score, 17.43% before 
the median decline of 36.48%. Now, there's a ton of man hours in the next question and the next answer. What was the score on August 24th, 2023? The closer it is to 17.43, the more concerned we would be. And the closer that it is to 100, the less concerned we would be. Probably fair to say we're closer to 100. And we'll most likely be expanding on these concepts in future videos. The basic takeaway is from a probability perspective, we're in much better shape relative to March 27th of 1974. And the same can be said for the other cases that we've examined. 1969, 2001, and 2008. Does that score align with or contradict the theory that a debt crisis is imminent? And what does that score tell us about the probability of a financial crisis-like decline in the stock market, additional decline, I might add, and the probability of a severe recession being right around the corner? And does that score align with or contradict the theory that the present day market profile is similar to this profile and similar to this profile? At the moment, the score firmly supports the base case. And it really doesn't change anything. We'll continue to take it day by day with an open mind about a wide range of outcomes from wildly bullish to wildly bearish. And since we like to use a way to the evidence approach, it's also noteworthy, rather than looking like these vulnerable periods in 1969, 1974, or 2001, this study from Bespoke says the present day doesn't look like the vulnerable periods, it looks like the bullish periods after the vulnerable periods. Signal, May of 1970, after this decline. Signal, October 1974, near the major low in this scenario here. Signal, March of 2003. That's after the bear market is over, and March of 03 is the retest of the October 2002 low. May of 1970, October of 1974, August of 82, the beginning of an 18-year secular bull market. March of 03, all similar to December of 2022, just a few months ago. This aligns with this, and this aligns with this from Bank of America Global Research. The 12-month rate of change on margin debt generated a bullish trend continuation signal for U.S. equities in July. Continuation seems to align with this type of score. And I believe we revisited the secular trend thesis in mid-June of this year. Talked about 2034 or 2035-ish. Also noteworthy, RBC Wealth Management. The 16 to 18 year cycle likely will peak near 2034. Here's the tweet. Here's the source of the tweet. Our friend Dean, a self-described market junkie, Hot off the presses this week. Leading economic indicators trigger a buy signal for stocks. After similar historical signals, the S&P 500 was higher 93% of the time 12 months later. The median gain, a hair over 17%. That would be an additional gain. His buddy Jay from Sentiment Trader. Hot off the presses. Two more breath and sentiment indicators arguing normal correction. I believe in last week's video or in a recent writing, we used the term garden variety correction. Which means, given what we know today, the term opportunity still applies. These are charts that we pulled on Wednesday. We could cover every one of them and they all align with rather than contradict everything that we've covered this week and in recent weeks. As always, the commentary in this week's video is based on the data and the facts that we have in front of us, which still align with this term here and align with the base case. A lot of good info on the website, including common FAQs. And the purpose of all of this is to help us more effectively navigate between a point A and a point B that could be several years down the road. And we all know the only way that we can do that effectively is we head into next week 
and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivaco Capital Management LLC or CCM is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.